So I want to welcome everybody tonight. This is the second of the programs we've had as part of our community food education program for the Young Cooperative. This is one of the things that if you are a member of the Young Cooperative, this is part of what your annual dues pay for. Uh, last week on Thursday, we had Howard Bleeder, who was a wonderful speaker, an Iowa farmer who spent 20 years with his hands in the dirt learning about GMOs and why he doesn't want them. <coughs> He's a fact guy, charts and numbers and pictures and this and that. Pam, on the other hand, Pam Larry, that you're gonna to get to meet tonight, is someone who just shares her dedication to this, her passion for this, and is the encourager, the person who motivates us to move. Howard gives you the facts and lets you make up your mind. Pam, I think, well, we'll see what she does. <laughs> Tries to kick your butt. <laughs> um. I'm, uh, I'm 57 now. I have done all sorts of things as, a, as jobs. I used to be a midwife. I used to be a farmer, uh, organic farmer. Um, I used to be a business person. I've worked with therapists as a consultant. I've done all different kinds of jobs, but never have I ever considered doing anything political in my life. Uh, but anyway, I, I really like real food, and I always have. I consider myself a very polite and sweet sort of food snob. And what that means is that I like real food. And I, I don't care for packaged, you know, chemicalized, fluffized crap. Um, I like real food. I like to taste the melon. I like to taste the buffalo mozzarella. I want to taste the, the real organic wine. I, want, I just love this stuff. And I can taste all that stuff that isn't real. So um, I'm also a bit of a geek, uh, you know, not, not, a, not a computer geek like that I can figure out that kind of stuff, but I love science and I love the you know, what humanity can create and think up and when I think about TVs and who the heck came up with that and how do they think of that stuff, you know, and you know, dating a guy that, you know, is a physicist and tells me, oh, yeah, I couldn't fall asleep the other night so I thought I'd see how big the earth has to be to be a black hole. I mean, I really, <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? Most people count sheep, but, you know, <laughs> But you know, I love that kind of stuff. You know, I love hearing people talk, and I love reading. And I, uh, my favorite films are science fiction. So years ago, when I first started hearing about GMOs, I thought, oh wow, you know, really cool stuff. You know, what's what we can do. And then I started reading more, and I went, oh my God, I'm horrified. You know, and I started remembering my uh, college professor, back, baby bacteriology is what we called it, because you know, when I was bi a midwife going to school for the medical kinds of things, and you know, my, my first uh, bacteriology professor said that a scientific fact is one that lasts longer than three years, you know, and you know, in everything that I ever explore, what is, fascinates me more than anything is the questions we don't know to ask. You know, what is it that we don't know we don't know about? Um, and looking at the wonders of the world and walking around in, you know, this beautiful area and go, why do we ever want to change anything about this? And, you know, just because we have challenges and opposition to what we think is beautiful, we as humans label as beautiful, that comes with everything. And it's just about learning the balance of all that stuff. And so the more I read and then, you know, then looking at these companies, you know, the company that created Agent Orange you know, and then lied about it in courts of law so that our veterans couldn't receive benefits. You know, and the children that are still paying for that, for that price. You know, the company that, you know, creates something called atrazine, which is a hormone disruptor and is messing with the planet and the animals and us, you know, going after, you know, scientists that are, you know, discovered that there's something wrong. And the fact that all the scientists around the world that come up with something that, that is counter to what the corporate party line is, they get vilified and they get, you know, attacked and they, you know, they might lose their professorship and they lose their funding. And, you know, I basically don't trust these corporations that started off as, you know, chemical companies in World War II. <laughs> now are creating our food system. I'm sorry, there's, there's something wrong with this picture for me. You know, it's just for me, okay? So I started to become incredibly depressed because I have two grandsons and I, ha I feel like a grandmother to all the children on the planet um, and that I have a responsibility right here. And I became increasingly outraged that this has all happened on my watch when I was asleep. 
and uh, you know, too involved in you know, all the other very important capital V, capital I things that were going on in my life. Um, and I, I started you know, getting just catatonic and I was crying and I was, you know, I was like, it was, it was awful. And I like to joke that my friends would always run away from me at parties or gatherings because it was like I was a multi-level marketing person, you know, always talking about the GMOs, you know. I was like, oh my God, did you hear about the latest thing that they're doing now? So um, anyway, I didn't, but I didn't know what to do. I mean, what can a person who's not a scientist, not a lawyer, not a, not a, not a, not a, not a, do in this world to affect change that would be everlasting? So I, you know, went within, cried, and then one day I was, was on January 20th at 7 a.m. Maybe it was 7:02 in the morning. I was in the hover state between awake and asleep, and it came to me to do a ballot initiative. You know, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but it was a pretty profound feeling in my body. I was no longer depressed or catatonic. I was charged. And you know how you get those rushes of inspiration and then you go home and it's like, oh my god. You know? <laughs> what if I, nobody knows this, but what if I agreed to here? I have no money. I have absolutely no knowledge about any of this. I don't have any connections. I've never done anything political before. I have no clue what I'm doing. So because I was terrified, you know, and I realized it was going to take some stuff, the other really, really, really clear decision I realized <laughs> I had to make was that I had to decide that it didn't matter how much of a fool I might end up looking like, that I wasn't going to stop until I was stopped. And I, because I knew, you know, sometimes when you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then you fail wildly, you can look like an idiot, you know. And who would think that a grandmother <laughs> from Chico, California, would succeed in anything like that, you know? So I was really setting myself up for looking like a fool, but I didn't care because to me it was more important to at least try. So I took six weeks to learn how to do a ballot initiative. I put up a website and I started reaching out on Facebook. Bless Facebook, it's gotten a little weird, but you know, at the time, a couple, in 2011, in Janu on January 20th, and you know, around then, it was still a pretty open and free space. Um, and so I started reaching out, and a woman in Southern California named Stacy responded. Uh, the um, uh, Organic Consumer Association was getting ready to have their uh, millions against Monsanto campaign, which has kind of been overrun by the march against Monsanto people. But then it was millions against Monsanto for a while. It was like, so we have millions against Monsanto, march against Monsanto, and moms across America march. So it was ma'am, ma'am, and ma'am. You know, <laughs> so so that was kind of interesting. We had to figure out all these acronyms for everybody. So um, anyway, but at the, at the time that was it, and they were having a um, a. Uh, Rally. They wanted to have rallies all around the, the world, all along the country. So we had one in Chico, and Stacy and I connected. And so part of my business plan was to start off in Southern California because that's where most of the voters are. So I got in Sally. She's my trusty steed. She's the 98 Toyota Camry that now has 333,400 and something miles on her. And I started driving, and I met in all sorts of venues and started talking to people, and people started saying, great idea. It's like, hi, guys, let's do a ballot initiative. And they go, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So all these people said yes. They saw the possibility. It's, it spoke to them of their frustration, their anger, their depression, and they found a way. They, they could see a way out. Okay. Now, the people I call the big boys who are the large nonprofits, the large organic companies, the large places, all the places that suck up all the money, they're the, or, you know, or, or get money from us in terms of our dollars, they didn't want to do it. They kept telling me, Grandma, go away. Who do you think you are? This is not a good idea. You will lose the election and you will kill the, the movement. That's what they told me, all of them, except for Ronnie Cummins from the Organic Consumer Association, who said, I said, will you publish an email, or a letter that I will write? And so I did. And so I, you know, I was on Facebook. The word was starting to spread on there. Um, Ronnie did the letter. More and more people started to write. I actually got calls from Washington people who wanted to do the same thing. I got calls from people in Florida, Illinois. Uh, people in Connecticut and Maine and Vermont started working on the, 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 the little seeds of working on legislation. 
And, uh, and so, but you know, these things take time, especially when you're a volunteer and you've got a life. Okay, but we just kept going and we started, you know, still traveling. I was always traveling, always traveling in my car. I lived out of my car. Uh, the kindness of strangers letting me stay with them and, you know, people listening to this crazy woman running around the state talking about something with no money and no, <laughs> nothing. So um, there was a point at which David Bronner contacted me and he too said, please don't move forward with this. It will be tragic. You know, you'll ruin everything. And a month later, I started hearing David has changed his mind. Mm -hmm. And so then he called and I met and then it was David's addition to what we were doing on the ground that it then amped it up into a much bigger plane because he was part of the big boy world. So we, uh, different groups started to come on board a little bit more. Um, we formed a steering committee. We had people write the ballot initiative. Uh, the people on the ground kept building and building and we had, trainings to get our, you know, our um, signatures. We had an amazing guy run the signature gathering campaign and he taught us how to do it in a way that was painless and fun. The barker and the caller, you know, the barker and the caller system. And so one person was out there, you know, bringing people in. The other person was making sure they were on the right county page. And it was, everyone was ready to go. And finally on February 18th, I, it was like, have you guys seen that movie um, with uh, Mel Gibson? Uh, what is that where they're blue? He was, what is that? The, Braveheart. 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 You know, the one battle thing where everyone's ah, running out in the field. Yeah, that's what it felt like. I could feel the whole state, you know, running out there and getting signatures. And it was really, at that point, we were so pent up. The energy was so pent up that we just, we did really well. And we, it had taken so long to write the initiative that we only had nine weeks to gather signatures. So, but in nine weeks between the paid people and the volunteers, we got 971,126 signatures. So it was really an amazing feat that, that happened. And um, it was wonderful. And then, and then like you guys, you, you just started your, vac you know, your commercials you know, on Monday. Yes, was that yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. But we didn't have any experience, so we didn't know. Like, we knew it was coming. We didn't know when, but we knew it was coming. And we were, like, waiting. It's kind of like, what, when is it? When is it going to come? When is it going to come? And then all of a sudden, it started. So the, the ads were, they lied. <laughs> they misrepresented things. They twisted the truth. All of that stuff happened. We got reports of Farm Bureau meetings where the Farm Bureau was telling farmers, you're gonna get investigated, every, you're gonna get, you know, someone's gonna come out and make sure you're doing everything like every week, as if anybody would have that kind of time or resources. Um, you know, you're gonna get sued, you're gonna go out of business, you're gonna blah, 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 this is gonna hurt small farmers. You know, so it was really, it was, it was very confusing and we watched our, we were doing well with the polls and we watched it go down and down and down. And we, you know, it felt like a sinking ship. We didn't know what to do. This had never, you know, we'd never done this before. We had a political advice, you know, campaign manager, um, but we didn't have the resources. I mean, basically at this point in time, you guys have what, like three and a half million in the bank or something like that? Yeah. We might've had three and a half million in the bank, but our states, five times as large as yours and our advertising budget, you know, our, they don't go as far, not just because of the size, but because everything's more expensive in California, you know, so the per minute thing is more expensive. Because we didn't have very much funding, the campaign manager made the decision <laughs> to wait until the two, last two weeks of the election to run ads so that they could be very targeted and focused. In retrospect, that was probably a mistake. But when you don't know if you're going to get enough funding, you make the decisions, the best decisions that you can. Also because of that, the grassroots really didn't get funded um, very, to the extent that they should have. We on the ground had kind of like thought, we, you know, I had, again, the business plan. We would do the work. We would be supported financially by the campaign because then we would fund them. But that wasn't quite how it worked out. So then we had to regroup and, you know, raise our own money to do a whole lot of stuff that we wanted to see done. So it was just this thing of watching this, you know, thing fall apart. You know, it was just horrific. And I kept saying, you know, during the camp, people were like, well, what do you think is going to happen? You know, as their poll numbers went down and down and down. And I was just like, I don't know. I think we still have a chance of winning just because the whole thing's been kind of weird, <laughs> you know, and you never know what things can turn around. 
But the day before the election, I was going through, um, we had a very, very wonderful, strong group of grassroots on the ground. We had about 90 groups throughout the state because of the traveling that I had done and continued to do. We had regular uh, phone calls every week. We had a private website. People got to know each other and connect. We maintain that connection, but that's a whole other story. It doesn't really matter. But the night before the election, um, we were, you know, you, when you're willing to devote a whole lot of free time to something, volunteer time to something, you know, many of, of these people donated 20 to 40, some of them 60 or 80 hours a week to this for over a year. They were so passionate about this. 85% of the leaders were women. 90% of their volunteers were women. They were doing this. They had never done anything political before in their lives. And this moved them to work. People don't do that unless they are very, like, I, I call it spiritual. Okay. So the night before the election, we decided to have a call and just acknowledge that because we didn't really talk about it during the campaign. And we just kind of all joined together so that we were all connected because we had all been working on this throughout the state. And it was the largest leader call we had. But when I was getting ready to do that, I was going through the pictures because we were going to do it on a webinar and show pictures. And I just started sobbing, 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 sobbing. And I sobbed for about four hours, just heart wrenching because I kind of knew, you know, and it was, I was disappointed at the loss, but I was more disappointed for them because seeing all the hope in their eyes, you know, and then to have been abandoned by lies, lies and, and to me, something that is evil ethically evil, you know, whatever that means to anybody. So anyway, that, you know, that happened. We had the, the election. Um, uh, I had a great time that morning. We, uh, the, the main Latino voice person for the No People had a, a store in Inglewood. This is, I think, the story I was going to tell you. Had a store in Inglewood. So <laughs> the day before the election, one of the volunteers who did a bunch of rogue stuff went up and down his street and put Lias on 37 signs all up and down his street. And then four of us went and did a honk away in front of his store. <laughs> it was great. And you know, I stood up, we all stood out there with our signs and, and we had a good time. And then um, she, the, the one person who put the signs up had gotten me bumper uh, license plates with GMO OMG and she had OMG GMO. And we went to this restaurant in Inglewood where they had painted this huge mural for Prop, yes on Prop 37, parked our cars, took a picture, had lunch, and then drove up to San Francisco for the party. So it was a really interesting day. And because I had sobbed the day before, I was able to be there while everybody else sobbed that night. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, but we didn't, you know, I had started saying about a week, a month before, that it doesn't matter what happens in the actual polling because we've already won. Because we could see that we had started a discussion in the United States that had never been, that had never happened before. We had sparked, you know, Connecticut had tried last year to get their labeling and it hadn't made it. Vermont and, and Maine had all tried, they hadn't made it. But this year, Connecticut and Maine both have labeling laws now. Now they have trigger clauses in them, which means, which say that there have to be four or five other states with an aggregate population of 20 million uh, and one of the states has to be next to them. But the point is, it happened. And, it, and Connecticut, I will tell you, because I know what would happen behind the scenes, both of the houses voted for it overwhelming, but the governor said that he was going to veto it until the woman, and it was a woman that started that whole thing and kept it going for two years, a woman with three children, until she asked the coalition of grassroots leaders throughout the United States to call upon your volunteers to make phone calls to the governor of Connecticut. And we made so many phone calls that they were pissed. <laughs> and so I've learned something about politics, and that's when it is. When the office starts being nasty to you and being angry, you know you're being effective. So when you, when you call and you're being treated rudely, you know that you're, you're making a dent. So because of our phone calls and because of a, you know, a few little shenanigans with the lobbyists, that passed. And because that passed, then Maine passed. And so now we are all around the state, around the country, I will tell you that all eyes are on Washington. That right now, what's happening here, right now in your state, and that you guys have in your hands, you have in your hands, is the most important GMO thing going on in this continent. It's so important. You know, 
we were asleep in this country and now we're awake. And I believe that you're going to win here, but I believe that you're going to still have a fight and the fight needs you guys. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you to do, take questions, but at the end I'm going to ask Trish and Florence to tell you some action steps that are needed because we need every one of you and every one of you are important. Some of you might choose to talk to people. Some of you might choose to do tabling. Some of you might choose to do the phone banking, which is so vital. And I'll just share about that right now. The phone banking is so important because the campaign has identified swing voters, okay, or people on the edge. You're polling now at 66%, which is really, really good. All you have to do is keep those voters. You don't have to find any more. You just have to keep them, but it's going to take work because their lies have started, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But they've identified them so that when you make phone calls, you're going to be calling those people, and it's going to be Washingtonian to Washingtonian. We're also having people from around the country call because we want to support you guys, and that's a way that we can support you. So I've got a lot of people from California making calls. I've been putting the word out to those grassroots leaders around the country. You know, Food Democracy Now!, Organic Consumer Association has put out the call. So you have support here. But it's really, really effective when the Washingtonians call each other because you can say, I'm your neighbor. I live in this county and I can tell you, you know, whatever. You have to follow the script, but not always. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, it's really important. It's really, the phone calls are really, really vital. I can't say it because it's like a personal commercial, you know, and they're talking to someone who's real and they're not looking at a box of some slick marketing, you know, tested message that this person has memorized. You know, it's you from your heart, and they will hear that from you. So really, really important. There are sign-up sheets over there. So your ads came out yesterday, okay? And about three weeks ago, maybe two, but three weeks ago, I think it was, I contacted the campaign, and I said, so does your definition of, of uh, food in Oregon contain pet food? Because that was a huge issue in this country, in our state, and it was the one that was the most damaging to us because we lost many supporters because of it, because they didn't understand and they weren't thinking it through. They just listened to the, to the, B, the PR stuff that, that the opposition was saying. So you're going to hear. I'm going to just, yeah, in just a second. So in California, our law, you know, laws are written upon laws and, you know, to incorporate with other laws. Ours came under call, something called the Sherman Food Act, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And in that, all laws have definitions of all the terms that they're using. And in ours, the Sherman Drug, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines food as including pet food. So it wasn't in the actual ballot initiative. It was in this other law that ours was off of. So when our initiative came, I, we were blown away. We were like, what? I, 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 it's not in the ballot initiative. Where does it say pet food? You know? But then we found, you know, I found out from the lawyers that it did, in fact. So the commercial was kind of a doofy dork looking guy in his backyard with an apron on holding a can of dog food, wet dog food, and a steak. And he had an apron on like he was getting ready to do a barbecue, you know, kind of like, you know, hunky dory. And he'd say, well, my dog, the meat and my dog food's going to have to be labeled, but the meat and my steak isn't which was a lie, okay? So yes, pet food would have to have been uh, labeled if it contained soy and corn, because most pet food does contain, contain soy and corn. But both would have had to have been labeled if the meat was genetically engineered. So it was a complete out and out lie. But they, it's like that, they twist it, you're gonna see, well, soy milk needs to be labeled, but regular milk doesn't have to. Well, hello, that's because soy beans are genetically engineered, milk, is not genetically engineered, you know, the RBGH is, but you have, you, you, the, the law defines what has to be covered, and what has to be covered is things and food products that are genetically engineered, okay? So, you know, the RBGH isn't the cow, you know, it's something that's injected into the cow. So if you included the RBGH, you could be challenged on your law because it would be including two different things, and it would have been nullified. So you have to take all that out of, out of the law. Okay, is, am I making sense here? Okay, okay kind of, sort of. Anyway, uh, but um, anyway, just suffice it to say that when you're out talking to people, all you have to remember to say is, just like our salmon, which is getting ready to be genetically engineered on the market, 
you know, released on the market. When the cows are genetically engineered, and they are being worked on right now, by the way, folks, did you know that they're doing things with, with cows to genetically engineer them so the milk is more like human milk? Okay? And so that's being worked on in China, okay? That pigs are being worked on. They're called enviro pigs. And that is to reduce the methane, supposedly, or whatever gas it is, in the CAFOs, which we don't want happening anyway. But that's supposed to be crossing it with a rat to reduce the, the gas. Okay, so, and, and goats, I mean, we, well, people do eat goats, but it isn't a common thing in our grocery stores, but it's being crossed with a spider so that when the milk comes out, it can be woven into a very, very durable cotton or a, a fabric that is very, very strong. So these things are happening now. Animals are being genetically engineered. So folks, when your cows are genetically engineered and on the market, those will be labeled because they will be genetically engineered. It's a really important thing to get the word out to people with the dog food thing, you know, because they're lying. I am hoping, I think that your laws here in, in Washington are uh, better, better than ours, which can allow you to basically say pretty much anything and not, you know, not get too you know, fined. Um, but here I'm hoping that your laws, your laws are a little more stringent with, in regards to advertising, that they have to tell at least the truth, you know, <laughs> if you squint, you know, I mean, because, but your law, okay, getting back to your food law says that this is, that food is defined as think, things that persons eat. So, and we were joking about it today that, you know, even though some animal lovers might consider their pets, you know, their dogs persons, that they really aren't legally persons, I don't think. So anyway, so the, that's one of the big ones. You're going to see, well, you know, your juice will have to be labeled, but your alcohol won't have to be labeled. And so, you know, like somebody just looking at that would go, well, that's really weird. But when you find out that alcohol comes under a completely different set of legal restrictions that are operated by the federal government that no state can really touch. You know, so we can't label alcohol. So there's a woman uh, that is a, uh, she does a radio show and she's an author in Marin County and um, she decided, okay, got to take the plunge. And so she uh, went in her pantry and decided to throw out everything that was GM could possibly contain GMOs. And she said, I was so depressed at the end of it. It was just so obnoxious. She said, I decided to have Johnny Walker. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and I took a look at it. <laughs> And that on the website it says that they used to be able to promise that it was non-GMO, but that there wasn't enough non-GMO corn that they could make that promise anymore. So she had to toss that too, but that's <laughs> and revert to something else. So. And is it, is it correct that there's basically no non-GMO corn, even when they call it organic? Because hasn't it all been uh, cross cross pollinated? And, and is there anything they can actually guarantee? Well, I can t I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you what I hear in my travels talking to the experts. So, um, first of all, the Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company, which if you guys ever have a chance to go to their Heirloom Seed Expo, it's phenomenal. It just happens, so you have to wait a year. They test all of their seeds for GMOs, and for the first time this year, they had to say with their corn that they can't guarantee that it's non-GMO anymore. So, and then I talked to the people at the Non-GMO Project, uh, which the, you can see the little symbol. I don't know if you know it, but it's yeah, little butterfly on a cute little plant. Yeah, so it's a non-GMO project. They're out of Bellingham, correct? Isn't that where they're out of? Bellevue. Yeah, you can just pass this around and look for this little symbol right here. It says non-GMO project verified, and um, they uh, they tell me that they get organic corn that is uh, sometimes up to 30% contaminated. Um, but often it's six percent, and so they they reject it, and so, because they you know they can't you can't you can't use it. Uh, but then they say you know there are other people that aren't quite so ethical, you know, and the the farmer has to sell their stuff somewhere, you know. So USD certified organic is a process, uh, and part of that process defines that you cannot use genetically engineered seeds. Um, but it doesn't mean that the USDA tests those seeds. And corn is such a, as I was sharing today, promiscuous pollinator, I love that word, <laughs> that uh, you know, you can, even if you planted a non-GMO seed, you can't be assured that what you get back is non-GMO. Because like Baker Creek sent out non-GMO seeds to their seed producers and it came back contaminated by 50%. So 
you know, it's an issue with the corn. And when I went to the National Organic Standards Board meeting, and they're, look, they're looking for comments right now for their meeting in, I believe it's in October. So you can go to the USDA side and tell them that you want stringent testing of genetically engineered seeds. Because even though the, so, the corn is a promiscuous pollinator, the soy and other things are not. But we have to start tightening up the standards. And when I said to them, I said, people are going to lose trust in this symbol. You know, it may be time to, rather than trying to constantly adjust the, you know, the, the um, what are they called, the standards, is what they call it, the National Organic Board standards, to, so more people can fit into the standard, we may have to let go of some crops. We may have to say, I'm sorry, we're too late with the corn. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, we blew it. You know, let's use this as a, an example and fight for our food because we've lost the corn. So I don't eat corn. You know, occasionally I will eat non-GMO project verified organic corn, o occasionally. Um, when I want a chip, you know, sometimes you just gotta have a chip. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an issue. It's luckily, like I said, it's the only one. Dr. Donald Huber, who you may, if you listen to Howard, heard, uh, heard him reference Dr. Huber. I heard him speak a couple of years ago. And as he wrote to uh, Tom Vilsack, the head of the USDA, the alfalfa is also a promiscuous pollinator. And he estimates that within five years, now three, that all of the alfalfa in the United States will be contaminated. So all the dairy folks that use alfalfa as a seed, if they want to remain organic, are not going to be able to use alfalfa if they want to continue to have their organic standards. It's getting tricksy out there. Okay. And you also need to know that just because it says, if it's tested, I, I will eat it non-GMO project verified because I know it's been tested. But it's not tested for, not for zero. It's tested for no more than 0.9% GMOs, which is the standard in Europe because there isn't really no such thing at the at-risk corn that you can say that there's no contamination. Another big issue is, are like the, they call them the micro-ingredients, you know, the natural flavorings. Folks, natural flavoring is scary. <laughs> you, this, there's a really fun new video out. There's a great young woman who's just come on the scene and she's called the Food Babe. And she's this young, very attractive woman, and she's funny, but she just, she's starting to a, a Food Babe TV, and her first video was about the natural flavoring of castoric, and it's titled, Do You Eat Beaver Butt? Because, <laughs> because basically, and it's hysterical, because it's basically about the fact that this is the, you know, the, the, uh, the gonad, no, they're not the gonads, but the, yeah, they're, the, they're from the anus of the beaver, <laughs> of a beaver. So she has this little, like, yeah, yeah, they, they yeah, huh? The glands, that's what I was thinking. I was trying to think of that word. Anyway, sorry, it left me. So yeah, it's, it's hysterical. She's outside and she's on this log with a little, you know, stuffed animal beaver talking to the beaver. It's really funny. And then she shows pictures of this thing. But yeah, most of the um, natural flavings, flavorings are either made out of something utterly disgusting or oftentimes they're genetically engineered. Uh, like, for instance, I read an article from the New York Times last year that talked about genetically engineered yeast that's genetically engineered with a cold water fish to put into ice cream so that it's very creamy. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so there's lots to learn. You know, it's a big, it's a big world out there with the food. And it's, you know, I love that saying, your grandparents all ate organic, they called it food. <laughs> you know, and so I think that, you know, things have changed since then. And one of the important things to remember when you're out there talking to folks is that all these agrochemical companies that are tied up and on the boards of directors of the food companies, the crafts and the General Mills, you know, they've all intertwined. And did you know that General Mills is owned by Philip Morris? And that they're using the same kind of tactics in the media that they use with tobacco, you know, that phrase tobacco science. You know, where we have the science and this is safe. And then you find out years later they knew that it wasn't safe. They lied to the public. They lied in courts and they lied every, everywhere else. So what makes us think that it would be any different with this if it's the same players? What, they finally saw the light to be ethical? I doubt it. I doubt it tremendously when they're, when they're making that kind of money. So I love questions because I love to talk about what you want to hear about. So what do you want to hear about? Yes? How do you talk to children about this? Carefully. Because what can happen is, is that they get, 
I'm sorry, yes, thank you for reminding me. The question was, how do you talk to children about this? And I answered that you talk to them carefully because there's a certain you know, innocence we want to maintain in our children, and yet we have to inform them so that when they're out in public and at friends' houses that they're not eating things. Now, there are a lot of children running around now with allergies, and they get a really instantaneous learning lesson, and they don't have to be talked about you know, too, too, too much. But I have two grandsons, and my daughter is very open about what's going on in the world with them. And one of the grandsons is five. And at, at, at our house, you know, I'll be sitting there listening with my earphones, oh my god, what are that, you know, again. And my mom will go, what? And I, the code word now is zombie apocalypse, because we don't want the children to get, it's like reminds us we have to be careful. Because at one point, the five-year-old, when she was talking to him in the car, started crying about Monsanto, you know, because he was listening to something on the radio. So gently, you know, just explaining to them that things have changed, you know, and if you don't want them to eat them, that's probably not the only thing you're talking about. You know, there are probably things like sugar, you know, that you want your children not to eat a whole lot of because of the hyperactivity thing. Um, and you just teach them, these are, this, is, this is the way that we used to eat and this is the way our family believes is healthy and it's going to keep you healthy for the rest of your life. And you're going to find a lot of stuff going on out there. But like, for, for instance, if they have a kid at school that's really kind of nasty because, you know, there are a lot of children that have a lot of problems now because they can't physiologically handle their emotions because of the bacterial gut are all messed up, you can point to that child, you know, and lovingly say, well, you know, sometimes kids that eat badly end up not being able to control their emotions like so-and-so. And so be gentle with them and be patient and be understanding, but you don't want to be like, you know, you don't want to have to lose yourself like that. You know, that's how I would speak to my children now. I was, you know, with the, you know, with the food when they were little, you know, they were the only kids with brown bread. <laughs> You know, even back then, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Another thing to be aware of about that is what you were saying about natural flavorings, and that is the vitamins. Mm -hmm. That's like a cesspool. Yes, yes, they are. They're so all, they're, most of them are GMOs, GMOs. yeah. And, and most of them are also manufactured by really big companies like mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be careful. The supplement industry is, they were one of the biggest opposers in 37. It was because of this, it's because they're riddled. And like when you, you know, reading a label, if it's vitamin A fortified or vitamin C fortified, the cereal, it's GMO corn, you know. So vinegar, I mean, it's everywhere. Vinegar, um, acetic acid, vitamin E. You know, it's kind of like when I talk about the right to know, and I did during the campaign, it's like, we have a right to know for this reason and that reason and that reason. But you know what? We don't need a reason. We have the right to know what we're buying and putting in our mouths. You know? It's just like, I don't have to justify to a corporation why I don't want their product, which is a nice little segue into something else we can talk about, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I don't know how many of you know about that. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a global trade agreement, which really isn't much about trade, but it's about basically the codification of corporate control of the planet. And it's the countries rimming the Pacific. However, unlike most trade agreements that are usually just with the parties involved, this one has an open end and anybody can join in. And what it does is it overrules local and like country sovereignty for their own laws. So things like in California, we have four counties that ban the growing of genetically engineered foods or crops. Uh, likewise, in, the Euro in Europe, there are quite a few countries that ban, and there are a couple in South America. What this will do is a company could go to my county, counties in my state and say, you're interfering with my right to make a profit. So we're suing you. And that lawsuit is going to be referred not to an impartial international court, but to a tribunal set up by corporations, by and of the corporations. So this is a big, big deal. It doesn't just affect food stuff. It affects internet privacy. It affects community banks that are starting to pop up, people wanting to get out of the, you know, the fiat you know, system. Uh, it affects 
labor laws because it then goes to the lowest common denominator. Oh, I can do business here. You know, I can hire 10 year olds, but I can't in your country. You know, and everybody will say, oh, you're overreacting. It's like, right. <laughs> You know, you're telling me to not worry, like I'm supposed to trust you that this isn't down the line. You know, it's about seed sovereignty. I don't know if you know this, but in Colombia, the, um, and they're trying to get this law in the EU where the only seats that can be sold are seats that are registered. And guess who will control that, you know? So in Colombia, they actually have this, they have this as a law. The farmers were not allowed to save their seats. Not allowed, I mean not only discouraged, but not allowed legally to save their seeds. And if they did, they could plant them in their gardens, but under five acres, and they couldn't sell any of it, okay? There was a riot, okay? It's been going on for three weeks now, okay? Finally joined by labor and students, and they have, this morning, I found out that they had overturned the law. But it took taking to the streets for this and sustained taking to the streets and like 300 or almost 300 people arrested, you know, and all sorts of stuff. So this, I mean, we, we wonder, oh, it could never happen here, never happen here. But that it's, you know, the steps are being taken. If they're trying to get it in the EU, you know, what is next? I mean, they just reintroduced it like in May and I've read the law, okay? And they just keep trying. They just keep trying. Exactly. So it's, you know, my post on Facebook today was that we stand with the people of Colombia. And then kind of like, come on, folks. <laughs> let's work on this now so we don't have to have it get that intense. Not let's, put, let's not put the farmers through that. We can take care of it now. So things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I find that those clicky little, you know, petition things, I hear from quite a few people who work with legislators that many legislators in states don't even open them. They don't care. No, they don't. Phone calls, however, to the point where you're pissing off the office are very effective. So I always advocate phone calls. Calling the office, leaving a message, have them have 120 messages that somebody has to beep, beep, beep through and so that they're annoyed with that. Call them. Go in and visit your legislators. Get to know them now from the local all the way up to the federal level because things are changing very quickly and we need to be nimble on our feet and have these relationships because it's not going to get easier. It's only going to get more complicated. But the neat part is, is that it creates community. You know what I mean? It brings us together in a unified voice knowing and, and realizing that we can affect change. And if I've learned one thing about this is that we can affect change because if I could spark on me, like the dork, like my children call me Dory, okay? <laughs> like have you ever watched Finding Nemo? Yeah. Okay. Dory the fish, that's what they call me, they call me Dory. And so if someone like me can spark something like this simply because I, was, I wouldn't let it go and I was willing to look like an idiot, then just think what all of us coming together can enact. But it means getting off our computers, okay? Not that computer activism isn't important because it's vital, it helps spread the word. But we must get out and start talking to people who aren't on the computer, who don't, aren't our Facebook friends, who would probably never be our Facebook friends because they wouldn't wanna have to read our posts. Okay, okay, and when we talk to them and we find that commonality, we find that humanity between us, we find the place where we all eat and it doesn't matter what religion you are or what political party you are or if you support abortions or you don't. None of that matters. It doesn't matter. Like, I was really undirective, like I wasn't too much of a dictator in 37, but there were a few things I was. It's like, you don't talk about your veganism, I'm sorry. What you eat is up to you. We may have a meat eater that wants to do this, and meat eaters are eaters, <laughs> and we need them. We need tea partiers, which, why don't, what county is it that has now endorsed the tea? Lewis, Lewis County tea partiers have endorsed I-522. You need every county's Tea Partiers to endorse I-522. And you need to talk because my experience with Tea Parties, they were some of the most wonderful people I worked with on the camp 37 campaign. We meet. When I was a midwife, 75% of my clientele was progressive, a lot of them hippies. 
The other 25%, which Tea Partiers didn't exist at the time, but they would probably be either Tea Partiers or to the right of Tea Partiers, you know. And, you know, I was at a sheriff's convention. It was really constitutional sheriff's convention, you know. Somebody walks up saying, so are you a Tea Party? And they're like, oh, no, they're far too liberal for me. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, you know, okay. But this is what you get. You get to meet all these amazing people who aren't like us, who have these amazing stories to tell us about worlds we have no idea about, but who all eat and all care. You know, many of many Tea Party folks and, and very, very conservative folks raise their own organic food. They drink, they raise the, the cows in our herd shares in California. That's mostly the political party of the of the farmers in our area. And they are vigilant, they're great, they're on it, man, and they're activists. You cultivate them, you get to know them, you love them, you embrace them. And what have you done? You have not only gotten your ballot initiative one, but you've created real community. Because it's easy to be friends with people who are like you. Okay? But real community is created when we all come together. Because we all have a stake in this. Anyway, sorry, a little soapboxy there. A little cheesy. Yeah. yeah. That was actually along the lines of my question because mm -hmm. earlier you had said that we already have 66% of mm -hmm. the voters. So on that piece and on the piece of uh, when we participated in the march against Monsanto, the biggest objections that I encountered um, were from people 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, you could buy leaded gas in Washington. Mm -hmm. And when that sunset clause finally kicked in, the gas stations put up these big signs saying, it's all the fault of the EPA. They're mm -hmm. taking away your rights and your liberties mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there's a somewhat of a mindset mm -hmm. among a lot of people in the state that anything along this line, these lines is an invasion of their rights. Well, their rights are already invaded is right. one of the things that I would so say. This is my question. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you like encourage um, open, calm, <laughs> insightful dialogue right, right. in that kind of a, a situation where you, you breathe a lot. People. Okay, yes. <laughs> you breathe a lot and you <laughs> reconnect to yourself and you know continue to find the commonalities, and at some point. You know, you realize that yes, you have this election going on now, and it's better use of your time to focus on the people who are out of your side. But you don't alienate them at this point, and you come back after the election. Mm -hmm. Okay, you come back after the election because there's a conversation to be had with folks who don't understand yet. They understand that the government's too controlling, but they don't understand they're already controlled. The food, their food's already controlled, and it's only going to get worse. This is a big rabbit hole for people to travel down. Okay, it is. Like, well, before I started this, I thought I knew it, and I had no clue. You know, they're genetically engineering humans. You know, they're, they're all sorts of stuff that is available and uh, being worked on right now. And I just think, you know, that whole saying of, you know, what we find out about is actually have been, like, what, 10 or 20 years in the making. You know, so this, this is already happening. You know, because you're in a campaign, if you're going to sit there and talk with somebody for 20 minutes who you know you're not going to be able to sway, then it's time to, you know, bless them, you know, thank them for the discussion and say, I, you know, I really need to talk to some other folks now. And I would love to continue the discussion with you after the election because it's really important to me for you, you know, to, to share with you what I know because I have a feeling that once you know what I know, you're going to look at it a little bit differently. You know, and that's all I'm going to say, but I'm going to respect where you're at. Remembering you only have to get for your election 50% of the votes plus one, but you are bridge building bridges right now. You are, so always kindness, you know, except for when you're in a debate with the opposition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, kindness and, you know, can, re realizing that this is just the beginning of a, because, you know, the initiative cannot cover uh, animals produce that eat genetically engineered stuff because they aren't genetically engineered themselves. 
Okay, so that's the next step. Okay, but that's my the next step. Thing was that that food can that meat cannot be labeled organic if the animals were fed right. genetically engineered. Right, knowledgeably. But you know, I'm just saying, okay. even even if all the people that buy their meat from the not organic store, you know, the conventional store, that food is, you know, and, and with the genetically engineered corn, it's, I just heard these statistics, rough statistics, because I never remember exact ones, which is why Howard is so wonderful, and Jeffrey Smith blows me away. I don't know how he remembers all that stuff. But it's roughly 43-ish percent of all the, the GMO corn is biodiesel corn for, to feed the world. Anyway, sorry, snarky remark. Another 40% of it is fed to animals in CAFOs, which are confined animal feeding operations. 20% of it comes to uh, we eat directly. So really, we have to also work. I mean, if, if we want to move the market, which many of us do, and for me, I want to work on it. I wanted to include them. I mean, we, we were devastated when we couldn't include them in California, but we have the same thing that a ballot initiative can only be about one thing. So if you include the animals who aren't genetically engineered, then it's two things, okay? So, but we've got to, those animals are like, like Vanda Nashiva calls it torture, you know, what we do to those animals. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it, that's happening on our watch, you know? So it's really important that that's the next step. So we're gonna be creating bridges for that and bridges for the other stuff that's coming, which is nanotechnology and synthetic biology. Okay. <laughs> Cheer up. It's okay. It's okay. Cause, yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. Um, yes. The competition's ads started yesterday mm -hmm. as well. Right. They already have the beer up there. Right. The, the meat at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. All those ads are already right. Cut, their work was a lot easier this time because they used all the same materials. <laughs> they didn't have to even create new materials, etc. Just change the the number of the initiative, basically. Yeah. You guys are lucky, though. I, I have to tell you that I'm really very hopeful for you guys, and I'm very positive about what's going on up here, as opposed to what's going on in Calif what, what happened in California, and I'll tell you some of the reasons why. The first one is, is that uh, there was a provision in Prop 37. Your proposition has it, uh, the oversight under something called the department, and I don't know which department. It's probably the health department or something. But you have that. You have the state is, is in charge of the um, oversight. We could not have that because we thought we would lose categorically because of it. Um, and so instead of that, we inserted a provision which was redundant. We didn't realize at the time. Uh, even though we had lawyers look at it, uh, we put in a provision for consumer oversight so that we as consumers would be empowered to test. And if we found genetically engineered stuff in there, we could sue the manufacturer. We have another law in California called Prop 65, mm -hmm. which is highly contentious, which is about uh, toxic substances. And there have been a, you know, tons of fr frivolous lawsuits where you know, sh you know, shenanigan lawyers will call up a company and say, hey, I think you have led blah, 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 blah. I'm going to sue you unless you pay me off. And so they use that, you know, and, and it got compounded because of the person who was the official proponent. So you don't have all of that. That was taken out of your initiative. So that's one huge one because that was one of the big lightning rods. Um, another thing that's really, really important is you, we didn't, I, I think I mentioned this here, I've been speaking so much, but we didn't have any commercials for a number of weeks. The no side was barraging on TV two, three, four times a TV show from morning until night. They spent a million dollars a day on their ads. Um, and we had no presence whatsoever for the first while because they thought that we would need it at the end. Um, you guys start our ads, because we're all, as I was saying around the country, we're all Washingtonians right now. So anyway, our ads started uh, the same day. Okay, so that's huge. Because even though, like we were told, that if we had even had one or two more million dollars early on, we would have won. We lost by a very small margin, very small margin, even with no money. Money that we finally got came in the last three weeks, which was too late. And then um, a team that was deemed to be not quite as good as your professional team. 
Okay, so that's another piece that I think is really, really wonderful. And this is the feedback I'm getting from the people that worked on both campaigns. Can you speak to uh, responding to the kind of shading, disinformation that is? Sure. All you have to do is talk about a few things. Give them a few examples. And we're working on some uh, visuals for you. I was hoping we would have it done by tonight, but GMO, there are a couple things. The cost factor. Uh, GMO Free USA is this wonderful Facebook group. And uh, 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 oh, she has the, the thing that we're going to have as a handout. And then there's going to be a poster that you can make. Um, she contacted, she's an international group on Facebook, and she contacted people all around the world to take pictures of uh, cornflakes boxes and with the prices there. And so some of them were a little more expensive, but some of, most of them were less expensive. So she was then able to put together a video, which she uh, had all these different countries, boxes of GMO uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, and the most expensive one was from Hollywood. <laughs> okay. So all, and it was the only one that had genetically engineered corn in it. Okay. So she's adapted it. They're, they continue to work on it. They're making it specific for Washington, so it'll be Washington prices. And she's got some pricing here. Um, and so this will be available for people to download and print from different volunteers. Uh, some, you guys will figure that out. And then we're also getting a poster made of just the top part so that you can see that in England it's 333, Germany 376, France 273. This is adjusted for currency and size of box. And in Washington it's $4.39. So that will speak volumes about the cost argument. You know, now you need to be clear with people if they ask you, like you have to cop to because you don't want to be dishonest like they are, that yes, there are some countries where it's probably more expensive. But the point is that there are a whole lot of countries where it's a lot less expensive, so your arguments about cost are moot. Um, the second thing that you can tell them, and um, I was also, oh, that was the other picture I was trying to get, was the, um, I completely forgot about that as a poster. So both the Green Party and the Democratic Party in California endorsed Prop 37. But what we had were, they, the opposition sent out tons of mailers. Like, you know, every week there was a new mailer. And one of the mailers sent to the county of Los Angeles, which is mostly Democratic, was a thing that said, and you can see this on, it's California Right to Know, carightoknow.org. You can Google in um, lying, uh, or, or something, you know, lying or misrepresentations by the opposition or something. There's a couple articles. And you'll see pictures there of mailers that were sent where at the top it said, Democratic Party Voter Guide. Okay? And it had Jerry Brown, or, you know, it had, you know, Obama, and it had Feinstein, and it had, you know, who are our reps, and then it had all of the ballot initiatives, and all of them were the same that the Democratic did, except for 37 said no. They sent these to the Democratic Party people in Los Angeles, okay? They also did it with the whole state, with the Green Party. They're liars. <laughs> you know, they're just liars. We caught them in numerous lies in their advertising. They had people saying they were from a university when they weren't. They said that the FDA says that these things are safe, and the FDA does not say these things are safe. They made a, a, an announcement that the American uh, dietitians, or whatever it's called now, ADA, said that these things don't, you know, are safe. And that they came out and said, no, that they were misrepresented. Okay, they made the statement. So you can talk about uh, the fact that Monsanto has been prosecuted in two different countries, France and South Africa, for lying in their advertising. You can talk about all sorts of stuff, but just those two examples are plenty. So you're speaking to, these are the people. You know, they're also talking about how pet food will be labeled when your law, your definition of food does not include pet food. And now I'm hoping that, your, that the campaign, you know, contacts the officials here and gets them to stop doing that because it's a lie. That in and of itself will be wonderful PR. They lied in their commercial. So, you know, part of it is, is hey, you're going to believe Monsanto? The people, you have to talk them out and let them know that they're buying into PR baloney. They're, it's, just, it's just not true. It's like you're accepting that what they're saying is true, not necessarily you. But you're like saying, well, they say this, you know, so it's, it's you know, it is not inconsistent. It is very consistent. Soy milk is genetically engineered. 
Milk is not. Juice has to be labeled. We can't touch the other. Okay, these are the things. Pizza, and when you take it out, these are the examples that they use. Pizza in a, in a restaurant or a takeout place is not labeled, but oh my God, it has to be labeled in a store. Isn't that inconsistent? When was the last time you bought a pe takeout pizza that was labeled? I just had dinner over across the street. There were no labels. There, was no, there were no ingredient lists on the pizza. Okay, so it's like this is about labeling food that's in a grocery store, the food that is labeled in our country. They are so slick, they trick you into thinking that what they're saying is true. And it's a very difficult thing to overcome. And it, you know, this is why you, sometimes you have to talk with somebody or find fancy graphics online because the Yes on 522 has this whole new series of graphics which you could download, put on a flyer and pass out. It's called the Truth Squad. You know, it's myths versus facts. And it just, you have got to keep hammering it in to, the, to folks that are willing to listen but not push it that this is what's the truth and that they're lying. Yeah? Um, we're on the topic of prices. You mentioned mm -hmm. earlier when we were talking that one of the arguments is that this is going to cost mm -hmm. consumer more. Would you tell them the demographics of the sure. voters in California? Sure. So after Prop 37, there was a poll done and after election poll to find out who voted, they do this all the time, who voted, who didn't, you know, what they voted and, you know, breaking it up into different, uh, like, Caucasian, Latino, African American, Asian, blah, blah, blah. So all this time they're talking about costs and all this time. So the, our predominant yes people were Latinos, African Americans, lower income, and the lower the education level. The people who voted against us were upper income people who could afford Whole Foods. <laughs> and the p more education you had, the less likely you were to vote yes. What? Wow. Exactly. That doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive, which was mentioned before. But I, th I think what we've talked about it, and I think what happens is, is most of those people, they've gone to grad school, which is indoctrinated, you know, I mean, that's a whole other topic of, you know, corporate control of our universities. But they've been in that, you know, academic world long enough to trust science a little bit more than those of us with our eyes open have. You know, there's also, I've noticed, you know, in Silicon Valley, a certain degree of, you know, a little bit arrogance that, you know, I know quite a bit and you don't. You know, and, and so therefore, when you combine those two things, there I understand. Um, so there you go. And also to remember that a lot, of, a lot of folks in California who are upper class with more education are registered Republicans, and the Republican Party came out against us. So, you know, that might have had something to do with it. I don't know. That, was, that wasn't in the poll. But it was very, very telling that it was the, the people who supposedly would have been most hurt, that, you know, all of the, the low-income mother from the middle of Compton, you know, won't be able to afford the food that's going to automatically go up twice as much, you know, and she's the one that voted yes, you know, yeah, the food deserts in the cities, you know. Yeah, yeah, they get it, they understand, we, why would it? Why would we trust the corporations, you know? They, they understand more than we do. Well, not we, you know. And I am sorry, guys, but it was mostly white men <laughs> that voted against it. But I will also tell you, this is another little trick that I haven't really talked about, that, yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, the, one of the things that was really interesting is that a lot of volunteers are annoyed with the right to know message and the campaign is pushing, but it really is very powerful, particularly with men. Because with a guy, I love guys, you can just say, hey, you might be against this, you know, but you know what, I own a right to know. And they go, yeah, that's true, you do. You know, they might still vote no, but they might agree with you, you know. But the women, that one doesn't tend to fly as much. They want to hear, if you mention their children, they're there. You know, they're involved, right there. So other questions? Right. Mentioned the children. <laughs> Would you like to hear about some of the food you're here feeding your children? You know? Yeah, that kind of a thing. So, and then I'd like your fearless leaders to say a few things. Christian Florence. There are, there are certain things that we, we are doing. We 
Um, it started off by being um, asked to um, look after Thurston County, Pierce County, and South King County, which is from um, Tacoma to Federal Way. So obviously that's too much for one or two people to manage. Um, the three most important counties for us to get votes in are Pierce County, King County, and Snohomish County, which is Linwood and up there, So because they are the most populous. So Pierce County is very important uh, for us. Um, we don't have very many volunteers in Pierce County. We've got a great little team here in Yelm. Um, we need to put signs up here in Yelm because we've just got our signs, our yard signs. Uh, we need to get, um, yeah, these are our yard signs. We need to get uh, bumper stickers on the back of cars so people driving around can see, because a lot of people don't know that it's on the ballot yet. Although, now that the ads have started, more people will be aware that it's on the ballot. But we were tabling, you know, we've been tabling for months and no one has a clue it's on the ballot. So, um, it's, you know, we're still, te you know, we're still instructing people about it. Um, so, there's a number of things that we need to do here. Um, apart from getting things out, we need to start moving into Pierce County because last night Pam helped us find a strong leader down in Olympia, which means that I can basically leave Thurston County alone and start working on Pierce. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is willing to come and help us in Pierce, if you know any, anyone in Pierce, in Tacoma, in Puyallup, where we can make contacts and go talk to them and then they'll know people so that we can get information out there, that's what we're very much in need of. You know, you know what, folks? It's only four weeks until your ballots go out. It's not like it's you're committing like people in California did for a year and a half or two years. And this is like so, I can't begin to tell you how important this is, what you're doing here in this state right now. I mean, really, it's like, I hate to be overly dramatic, but I am an Italian Leo, okay? <laughs> so it's like, you've got the world, you know, the GMO world is really like in your hands right now. We are all looking to you guys and we're trying to help, but you guys are here. And so it, you know, like I try to say sometimes, Activism work isn't always convenient, and it isn't always well-timed, and it's, sometimes it's really boring, but you know, it's what makes change in the world. And it's like, well, why do you continue? It's like, well, in, I don't know where this is gonna end up, <laughs> but in five years, I'm gonna be able to look in the mirror and know that I did everything I could. And I will tell you that the people, I, I'm not meaning to be guilt trippy here. My children would disagree with me, but I'm really serious. I'm not trying to be guilt trippy, but like the people in California that I talked to after the election, the ones that were the most upset, the ones that were the most angry, how, who did whatever wrong, blaming everybody else for everything they did wrong so that we didn't win. Those are the people that didn't volunteer. Okay, they were the most upset. Right, 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 right. The people who volunteered and knew that they gave their all, grieved. I'm not going to say they weren't affected because they were devastated, but it was short-lived and they moved on and they're still active because they saw that what they did made an impact not only in California, but throughout this whole country. And I'm telling you, the world was watching us and they're watching you because even though we had the partial victories over there. You guys are it. You're going to be the first state to tip the tide. But it's not, pro it's not promised to you. It's something that you're going to have to work at. And it's only for just a few more weeks. You know, I mean, really, if you care about this issue, what can possibly, ask yourself, what can possibly be more important than this right now? If it's even a half an hour a week, if everybody here even did a half, one phone call, two phone calls, go in and visit a pastor for half an hour. I was like, really? <laughs> you, know, you can't even do a half an hour for something that's going to change the world? And I promise you, you're going to feel really cool. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Those books. <laughs>